Hello, and welcome to the program. Uh, this is the Black Ponder. I'm your host, Neil Trotter. Uh, how's it going? I haven't posted a video in a little bit. Um, and you know, what is it? Just life in general. It keeps you busy. Um, you know, and I, in this channel, I re read philosophy books, and I do a lot of reading, but not all the reading that I do is philosophy related, so it's not really related to posting to this channel. <laughs> so, so that's the other thing. I mean, and then there's there's all types of other things why I haven't posted. But first, do you like the the drab background? It's all white. <laughs> yeah, this is a lo-fi channel. You know, you gotta work with what you can work with. <laughs> also, uh, maybe the lighting is halfway decent. You know, I, I have brought back the troll um, lock here because I know a lot of people love that. <laughs> Y'all know I don't care, you know, if you watch the, the show. But today, 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 what we're going to be talking about is this book right here. It is called Abolition Geography, Essays Toward Liberation. It's by Ruth Wilson Gilmore. So we've talked about abolition before um, as a philosophy. Now, abolition is more than a philosophy. It's also a form of activism. It is also um, a movement, a political movement. It's, it's politic. It's also a practice. That's right. And, you know, that's one of the other reasons why I haven't posted in a bit. It's because, you know, I've gotten more involved with activism. You know, actually going out and hitting the streets. You know, um, doing some social activism out there with the signs and, you know, doing tabling and canvassing and all that and being, you know, more political. And, you know, I mention that because that's relevant to what we're going to be talking about here with uh, this work right here. Abolition. Uh, so what is abolition? Um, it is the movement, <laughs> the political action, the social activism to abolish prisons, police, and surveillance. Now, you might have heard of this movement before, you know, people screaming, defund the police, you know, abolish the police, you know, that kind of thing. You know, a lot of people feel like that's this far left uh, mentality and it's kind of a, you know, super radical type of way of point of view and it's not very constructive and is quite destructive actually. Um, but, you know, I, I'm here to, to, to break it down philosophically and kind of give more of a critical eye to it and to say, well, actually, it's a, it's a practical, um, you know, quite intelligent uh, analysis of the problems of society and it's, it's trying to figure out solutions that are realistic and uh, needed, right? It's not just some quack job type of operation going on. No, you know, it's actually a, a movement that uh, is very important. You know, and actually one that I personally subscribe to. So let's talk about it. So, you know, Ruth uh, Wilson Gilmore. I think there's a picture here of her right here. You can Google. Oh, yep, there it is. Um, old school uh, abolition activist. Been uh, talking about abolition. Been, been, you know, working toward abolition for years, decades. Right there beside, you know, people like Angela Davis and people of that nature. And this is a, a collection of her essays about the topic and, you know, her struggles and her initiatives and movements and work toward this goal, this uh, political practice, this philosophy. I just want to, you know, break that down, let you t talk a bit about the author because, um, yeah, this is, she's not like some quack job or some, some far left radical, uh, you know, crazy person. <laughs> this is an academic, uh, a scholar. Uh, you know, a critical thinker, a social activist, a mover and a shaker, you know. And you'll see this as we read quotes in the book, which is what I like to do here in the Black Ponder. Uh, so I will begin with a quote. I will tell you the page numbers if you want to follow along. And so this is a collection of, of essays. So I'll also give you like the, the name of the essay. Uh, this is the essay, Public Enemies and Private Intellectuals, Apartheid USA. And this is page 80. We start at the last paragraph here. First line. The need for oppositional work is unquestioned. But what is oppositional work? As the old folks say, 
If you're going to talk the talk, you've got to walk the walk. Oppositional work is talk plus walk. It is organization and promotion of ideas and bargaining in the political arena. Mm -hmm. So, yes, we just talked about that, right? Where I was saying, look, I'm trying to get more involved with social activism. I'm trying to transition over from just being a keyboard warrior, just typing on the computer and like having virtual debates on YouTube to like actually like having constructive conversations about very important topics like policing or social injustice or, you know, the prison system, criminal justice system, just out people on the street who think very differently than I do, you know, trying to, you know, change the minds, not having that expectation that I will, <laughs> but, uh, you know, trying nonetheless. And that's what this is what she's referring to. Um, Ruth uh, Wilson Gilmore about um, oppositional work oppositional work not some you know it's, people use all these politically charged wor words like radical socialist or far left radical or uh, far right wing conservative or something like that you know these kinds of politically charged words but this kind of oppositional work this abolition um, it goes beyond that kind of surface level um, argumentation <laughs> but uh, you know, you're just going out there in the streets and really looking at the problem critically and doing the work to try and like change minds and like break down systems and rebuild them from the ground up. But this is indeed a philosophy channel. <laughs> but, and so uh, what we want to talk about here is philosophy of abolition. Philosophy of abolition. Ruth uh, Wilson Gilmore is a scholar of uh, geography. That's her field of expertise. And that is interesting because she looks at geography um, in many different ways. And one of the primary ways she looks at geography is through a philosophical lens. She talks about the philosophy of geography. And that, that's pretty, not only is that very interesting, but it's also quite applicable and constructive. So let me share you that. We're on, I'm going to read you my second quote. This is page 92, and w what we have here is the essay, Scholar Activists in the Mix. <laughs> so I'm going to start at the end of the second line here, or, yeah, second line of the first paragraph. Geography is the last materialist discipline. I skipped down five lines. Why an activist lecture on race, culture, and power will go study where is Nebraska? I, you know, Gilmore, the author, reply that actually I was going to study why is Nebraska. Right, so typical geography is where where is Nebraska? Or where is Tennessee? Or where is, you know, pick your location. But uh, she's more interested in why Nebraska? Why Tennessee? Like, <laughs> Why the United States of America? Uh, why uh, Spain? <laughs> you know, why are, is a geographical location a location, a place, rather than where? That's philosophy. Okay, let's continue. I skipped out three lines. Motivated to learn how to interpret the world in order to change it, I found in geography ways to contemplate and document the vibrant dialectics of objective and subjective conditions that, if properly paid attention to, help reveal both opportunities for the impediments to human liberation. Space always matters, and what we make of it in thought and practice determines and is determined by how we mix our creativity with the external world to change it in ourselves in the process. In other words, one need not be a nationalist nor imagine self-determination to be fixed in modern definitions of states and sovereignty. To conclude that, at the end of the day, freedom is a place. Freedom is a place. That is an interesting way to think about freedom. It's a place. Not so much a mode of being, but a place, a location, a locality. Keep that in mind. How so? Well, let's continue reading. 
skip that on a line. How the lively hyphen that articulates scholar and activist may be understood and enacted as a singular identity. Okay, so not just scholar, right? Not just activist, but scholar hyphen activist, both. And we were just talking about that. How I haven't posted a video because I've been trying to get more involved with activism, not specifically just focusing on scholarship and just reading uh, texts and just talking about them on the internet, um, which is fine. That, that's a good thing to do too. But, you know, putting that into practice, trying to make the world better through like, you know, real world application. Philosophy as activism. I skipped down 11 lines. <laughs> For example, in the effort to dismantle the prison industrial complex, prison industrial complex. <laughs> we'll bring that up later. But that's one of the goals of abolition, is to abolish all prisons. One trajectory frames prisons as new forms of em environmental racism, which are equally, if differently, destructive of the places prisons come from and the places where prisons are built. Such destruction shortens lives and all people caught in prisons gravitational feel, okay? All the prison's area of influence, geography, are vulnerable to its ambient material and cultural toxicities. And then I, you know, I write notes in the margin. This is why I wrote my notes. Social injustice implemented by geographical violence. Mm -hmm. So this is how we're thinking about geography within this philosophical um, activist framework. So it's more than just, what's the capital of Idaho? <laughs> Tell me where the location of the Mediterranean Sea is. <laughs> How big is the Arctic Sea in relation to the Indian Ocean? <laughs> Ar Arctic Sea, Arctic Ocean as it relates to the Indian Ocean. You know, those kinds of, <laughs> that kind of like elementary geography that you learn in school, in elementary school, no, no, no. We're getting deep, you know, we're getting like postdoctoral <laughs> here. But not only are we getting postdoctoral, we are applying this po postdoctoral level of thinking um, to like everyday life to try and make this world better. We're not just keyboard warring, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Okay, now I'm on page 95, still the same essay. I start on the third line. Such cultural or ideological work connects with, reflects, and shapes the material or political economic relations, enlivening a locality as a place. Okay. Enlivening a locality as a place. Okay. It's not just uh, what's the capital of Idaho, like we were saying. It's why is this city the capital of Idaho? <laughs> right. Or why is this prison located in this place? right to be more direct about what we're actually talking about but i'll continue that necessarily links and represents other places at a variety of time space resolutions time space resolutions time and place we're thinking geographically okay this is this is important to think about it in this way as i continue to bring up more quotes we're going to understand why is that's important so now we're going to get into uh, the reality of social activism. What's, what's the point? Uh, you know, the whole SJW kind of attitude where a lot of people think that's negative, as I am not for that. I think social activism, being a social justice warrior, in its true sense, is very important, right? And with what's needed. And one of the things that why it's important is because, you know, people are oppressed and discriminated against based on a number, number of different factors, class, race, gender, and other like social um, dimensions and markers. So specifically what I'm gonna read you next is about race, right? And, oh, and I forgot to mention, this is part of a series. This video is part of a series uh, that's a long running series, been around for a while, why the black ponderer is called black ponder. You know, why, why do I call myself black ponder instead of just ponder why well, i gotta insert the race thing like you know because some people get disturbed over that they get triggered <laughs> right they're like oh i just wish you wouldn't use that word like 
Yeah, but we got to do it because it highlights a problem that's real and it's not fake and it's an act, a thing that actually needs to be addressed. Um, and so, uh, yeah, we're going to talk about the reality of race manifested geographically. Okay, because we can look at the situation geographically and that can tell us a lot about the reality of race and, and racism. So I will begin on page, uh, what page is this? 107. And this is the essay, Race and Globalization. Okay, this is the week, I start in the beginning. While there is no legitimate biological basis for dividing the world into racial groupings, race is so fundamental a socio-political category that it is impossible to think about any aspect of globalization without focusing on the fatal coupling of power and difference signified by racism. Racism is the state-sanctioned and or extra-legal production and exploitation of group-differentiated vulnerabilities to premature death in distinct yet densely interconnected political geographies. So that was a great definition of racism and it is actually happening. <laughs> you know, there's people who are like, well, no, racism doesn't exist anymore. This is the year 2022, right? We, we've had a black president, <laughs> right? But no, racism still going on and you can see it uh, geographically as stated in this um, quote right here. But you know, don't take my word for it. Let's continue with some more uh, quotes to explain that even further. This is the same essay, but um, a few pages uh, past. This is page 112 in this book. And I begin on the third line of the second paragraph. Okay, two points. Two points that's raised here. One, societies are structured in dominance within and across scales and two race is in some way determinant of socio-spatial location so a way to understand the first point is to think about all the components or institutions of a society at any scale and then ask about differences of power within and between them are corporations stronger than labor unions do poor families rank equally with wealthy ones does education receive the same kind of financial and political support or command the same attention to demands as police or the military? Do small food producers enjoy the same protections and opportunities as agribusinesses? Are industrial pollutants and other toxic wastes spread evenly across the landscape? Do those who produce toxins pay to contain them? Are people tried in courts by juries of their peers? Having thought about these kinds of institutional relationships, let's turn to the second point. According to the society's official or common sense classifications, how does race figure in and between the institutions? Okay, so my notes I wrote, race determines the, the answers of all these societal questions. Okay. It is interesting, I, I use the word determine. I, I pause for a minute, I'm like, is that the right word or should I say answers? No, race determines the answers, <laughs> right? Because you can't answer these questions truthfully without factoring in the influence of race. It's just impossible, right? If you, if you look at the statistics and you see the world as it actually is, you see, okay, race plays a, a, a strong, influence to the answers of these questions. And these are societal things, right? These are societal issues. These are systemic issues, which means they cannot be ignored by individuals and then go away. <laughs> That's another important thing, because a lot of people will say, well, just ignore it. Just ignore races. Race, the, um, race is a concept. You know, if you just ignore it, it'll just go away. But when your entire like society is structured based on systems that use race to uh, control power, that cannot just be ignored, right? That's just not gonna go away by just not acknowledging it, right? But I'll continue, this is, we're on page 113 and this is the third line. Race is structural. As I just said, it's structural. 
but uh, what structures do does race make let us turn the question inside out and ask how fatal couplings of power and difference might be globally represented okay skip down to seven lines the cumulative effects of worldwide colonialism transatlantic slavery western hemisphere genocide and post-colonial imperialism plus ongoing opposition to these effects appear today on any adequate planetary map of the 21st century as power difference topographies for example north south <laughs> right currently i live in the american south tennessee all right but then there's the north right northern states okay that's geography but is geography based off of race is it not let me continue unified by the ineluctable fatalities attending asymmetrical wealth transfers such as intergenerational wealth which is a real thing right that's uh, another thing that's not just made up right uh, there's a reason why uh, wealth is disproportionately spread across different racial demographics all right there's a reason behind that which is real okay it's not like something made up what other um, structural examples do we see of race uh, well you know there's a uh, police think about police they originated as uh slave patrols police in uh, america the fr they were first they first started as uh, slave patrol organizations in the south <laughs> right and in the north they were constructed as like uh, union busting organizations and you see that to this day right you see uh, the police disproportionately targeting the poor and people of color why is that right because it has to do with the, the origins of where they came from <laughs> right the geographical origins as well as others but geography is important consideration it helps us understand why things are the way they are but let me continue this is page 114 this is the fifth to the last line racism functions as a limiting force that pushes disproportionate costs of participating in an increasingly monetized and profit driven world onto those who due to frictions of political distance cannot reach the variable levers of power that might relieve them of these costs and i'll i want to read you this footnote 27 at least the beginning of it i use friction of distance to theorize the metaphorical and material drag coefficients that differentially impede the movements of people things relationships and ideas across geometric as well as social space and that's important to think about why is it harder for some certain kinds of people certain types of people to gain power social power whether that's financial economic you know education safety from crime and safety from um, you know harassment that type of thing why is it harder <laughs> right and you know that kind of drag that social drag is um, she notates that and she gives it a name and you know make sure you understand like this is something that's real and we need to take it into consideration it's like a coefficient right like in mathematics uh but yeah i'm going to continue this is page 115 this is the beginning of that page what is the character of such friction why is the cost of mobility so prohibitive for some especially in the current period that is colloquially characterized by increased some say hyper mobilities i skip down six lines in any society those who dominate produce normative and normative here is italicized like you know this kind of false reality primary definitions of human worth through academic study laws and uh, applied activities of medical and other experts as well as through schooling news entertainment and other means of mass education those who are dominated produce counter definitions counter definitions true definitions who we you truly are as opposed to what the societal expectations 
that are you know rooted in these social constructs that aren't real but they create real effects <laughs> right but counter definitions is the true reality so I'll continue which except in extraordinary moments of crisis are structurally secondary to primary definitions okay while such counter definitions might constitute local common sense their representation in the wider ideological field is so sporadically amplified responses to regional norms rather than as the fundamental terms of debate on all fronts then racism always means struggle right because you're constantly struggling against these societal definitions it's true like you know there's no true biological foundation <laughs> for the concept of race is a, a social construct that is fictional that's true but that fictional construct creates these these real uh frictions of distance is what she what uh, gilmore is, is saying here that actually holds you back in society um so to fight though that drag we, you know counter definitions are created which show like no this actually is uh this isn't true like what you're you're describing it as is not true although the the uh, the social construct is false the effects of the social construct are real so it's not as simple as oh that you know it's it's these constructs are fake therefore they can be ignored right no right you have to uh, construct new counter definitions new reality truths and then you have to like fight back against those uh those false realities right but you have to acknowledge the false realities you can't just not acknowledge them right that's what's important but i will continue whether radically revolutionary or minimally reformist anti-racism is fought from many different kinds of positions rather than between two teams faced off on a flat featureless plane all right indeed organized and unorganized anti-racist struggle is a feature of everyday life and the development and reproduction of collective oppositional capabilities bear opportunity costs okay so what did i put in my notes here i put racism manifests and not so much traditional bigoted racism yes so that's the thing people will say like well you know i'm not racist or racism doesn't exist nobody calls anybody the n-word anymore or you know if you see that it doesn't really affect people anymore right or you might see people call it each other the n-word on like message boards or forums or chat groups but that's not really what's going you know that doesn't really hold you back you know or like nobody you know very few people actually really hate you know people of color right there but what what's being said here is you no know, that's not the primary way racism manifests and we talked about this on in other videos right uh you know it's not about like individual attitudes or like personality types it's, it's structural is the way our our societal structures are built right and we all have to navigate through these structures because we all live in this in, in this society right and the structures are are built you know that tailored that cater better to certain people than others so it's important to understand that right it's a structural thing it's a systemic thing it's not just like this bigotry or this personal attitude or personal hatred and here what we're doing is we're defining the problem as it really is Right. which is you know a key thing in philosophy you know making distinctions and it talks about anti-racist struggle is a feature of everyday life the author brings up you know like the concept of microaggressions like the idea that you're constantly having to navigate or deal with like these structural issues that have to do with your race right and you're just constantly having to deal with that and it's not so much like an issue of personal hatred towards it. it's just the, the the way society is structured but I'll keep going. This is page 116. This is the second paragraph. The deepening divide between the hypermobile and the friction fixed produces something that would not surprise Albert Einstein. <laughs> right. Depending on the social spatial location in the global political economy, certain people are likely to experience time space compressions as time space expansion 
<laughs> right. And yeah, that's what we're talking about. Like that's how race manifests or racism manifests. Like certain people get certain privileges. Those same things that privilege certain people disadvantage other people, right? And it's a structural thing. It doesn't it has very little to do with like how people feel, <laughs> right? It's like how our it's how our societies are are built. And the fact that there's so many people who are like, we should ignore this. Don't call yourself the black ponder. Just call yourself the ponder. You know, it's like looking at this this structure that's like built in an unfair way and just being like, oh, that doesn't, that's not really a thing. Just ignore it. <laughs> I will continue to benefit at the expense of you, uh, but it's not really there, <laughs> right? That's, that's what we're talking about here. So let's continue with how does geography relate to all this? You know, we, 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 we've been talking about geography. Let's talk more specifically how, you know, this concept of abolition, getting rid of prisons, police, uh, surveillance, uh, how can we use geography to achieve that goal? So we're in the same uh, essay, this is page 124, it is the second paragraph. I will read. The weight of new and harsher laws falls on poor people in general and especially people of color who are disproportionately poor. Okay, and these are just um, statistical facts that you can look up. You know, I have other videos that point this out and, you know, just all you got to do is look at public records. And it's true, like harsher laws um, affect poor people disproportionately and they affect people of color disproportionately. Indigenous people and people of African descent, citizens and immigrants are the most criminalized groups. Their rate of incarceration climbed steeply over the past 20 years while economic opportunity for modestly educated people fell drastically and state programs for income guarantees and job creation withered under both Republican and Democratic administrations. Okay, this isn't like a, you know, Republican versus Democrat, you know, I'm a pro-Republican, I'm, I'm a pro-Democrat, like, no, we're talking about just the, 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 the entire structure, overarching structure, okay? Citizen and immigrant Latinos in collapsing primary or insecure secondary labor markets have experienced intensified incarceration. And there has been a steady increase in citizen and immigrant Asian and Pacific Islanders in prison and jail. Finally, at the same time that revision uh, to federal law have curtailed in constitutional protections for non-citizens accused of crimes, and for all persons convicted of crimes, immigration law has adopted criminalization as a weapon to control cross-border movement and to disrupt settlement of working people who are non-elite long-distance migrants. And by the way, she like, uh, you know, footnotes all those. Uh, every time she makes a statement, it's not focusing. Uh, even, you know, it's, it's small text. Uh, she footnotes all that. So, you know, if you, you know, are curious and want to know where are they, she getting all these facts? You know, I'll be more than happy to, you know, link to the, the facts. If you have trouble finding them, the statistical analysis and the, all the stu social, sociological studies that have been done that show these kinds of facts is true. Okay, but I'll be happy to link that. All you gotta do is comment below, right? But these things are happening, but I will continue reading. Does the lawmaking and prison building fury mean there's more crime? Although data are difficult to compare because of the changes in categories, the best estimate for a crime as a driving force of prison expansion shows it to account for a little more than 10% of the increase. Rather, it is a greater propensity to lock people up as opposed to people's greater propensity to do old or new illegal things. That accounts for about 90% of US prison and jail growth since 1980. People who are arrested are more likely now than 20 years ago to be detained pending trial and those convicted are more likely to be sentenced to prison or jail and for longer terms than earlier cohorts. Right, so there's a, there was a shift, right? And uh, particularly starting in the 1980s um, where, you know, people were more concerned with, or there was this, uh, idea that came to be the sociological idea like we need to build more prison like prisons need to be the way we solve the issue of crime 
even though like crime was kind of was going down during that time. But further to that point is why is it that we were so quick to rely on um, prisons, right? And you know, a harsh uh, punishments or like you know, police policing, like very extreme policing to deal with crime. And that's like our, always our first go-to. Uh, no, no matter what the crime situation actually is, right? We're always like more, more cops, more prisons, more laws, right? More uh, a punishment, harsher laws. Think about that, that philosophical um, point of view. What's that about? Uh, but I'm gonna continue onward to, this is page 126. Uh, this is the end of the fifth line on that page. Recent qualitative and qualitative research in the United States demonstrates that prisons do not produce the promised outcomes for a number of reasons. Okay, they don't reduce crime, <laughs> essentially. New prison employees do not live in amenities, starved towns where prisons go, while 60 to 95% of new prison jobs go to outsiders. Okay, so now we're getting geographical. Okay, okay. Uh, prisons have no industrial agglomeration effects. The predominance of local institutional purchases is for utilities, which are usually extra locally owned. Okay. Locally owned retail and service establishments such as restaurants are displaced by multinational chains which drain already scant profits from the locality. When a prison site is authorized, land value increase amid the euphoria of expected growth, but after construction values drop again. Anticipatory development, particularly new and rehabilitated housing, fails leaving homeowners, especially the elderly, with their sole asset effectively devalued due to increased uh, vacancies. Renters bear higher fixed costs because of hikes during the short-lived construction boom. As a result, prisons can actually intensify local economic bifurcation. And I'll skip down uh, three lines. Most prisons come from urban areas where the combination of aggressive law enforcement practices and greater structural strains produce higher arrests and conviction rates than in rural areas. Suburbia is following urban trends. I skipped down 12 lines. Prisons also provide localities with free prisoner labor for public works and beautification, which can displace local low wage workers. So locality displacement creates adverse geography. That's what I wrote in my notes. <laughs> locality displacement um, creates adverse geography. So what, what's going on here is the negative effects of prisons outweigh the positives. And those negative effects are uh, ge geographic, right? They're affecting the localities of the prison. Remember, um, the author was talking about uh, gravitational field around the prison, <laughs> right? There is a, uh, a geographical uh, influence around the prison, is a negative influence. Okay, so let me read you where page 130, and this is the, the fifth line of the second paragraph. While elections and politics are not identical, the power to vote has been central to struggles for self-determination for people kept from the polls by the frictions of terror and law throughout the world. In the United States, black people fought an entire century, 1865 to 1965, for the vote. As of 1998, there were nearly 4 million felony disfranchised adults in the country, of whom 1.37 million are of African descent. The voter effect of criminalization returns in the United States to the era when white supremacist statutes barred millions from decision-making processes. Today, lockout is achieved through lock up. Okay, we talked about that extensively in the video about the new Jim Crow, that book, I, another book that is heavy in abolition philosophy. And I put in my notes here. Uh, you might think felons don't deserve to vote, but the thing is, the thing is, uh, people of color are 
unfairly targeted by the criminal justice system at disproportionate rates for mostly nonviolent offenses. So this is discrimination, it's not justice. Right? You might think like, well, if you're a criminal, then you, know, you don't deserve to vote. Your vote is taken away. But the thing is, why then are uh, people of color are disproportionately targeted by the criminal justice system? You know, people who say that, who say like, well, you know, they don't deserve to vote. They completely ignore, they turn a blinders on like, okay, but who is being criminalized? <laughs> and is the criminal justice system fairly targeting like people who commit uh, wrongful acts, <laughs> right? You know, what about that whole thing? Like, you know, you're missing like half the story here. <laughs> But that, that's what abolition is about. It's like, okay, let's, let's not ignore this problem. You know, there's a lot of people who say, well, what, what are we gonna do with the criminals or the bad guys? It's like, well, an abolitionist will come back and be like, well, we're not, you know, many bad guys and you know, people who commit wrongful acts, nothing's being done to them, <laughs> right? Whereas a lot of innocent people or uh, lots of kinds of people are disproportionately targeted. So the, the, you're, you're bringing up a problem that's not being solved currently, <laughs> right? So you, know, you, you gotta think things through more critically, is what I'm saying. But let me continue where I left off. The 2000 US presidential election, strangely decided by the Supreme Court, rather than votes, was indirectly determined by massive disenfranchisement. George W. Bush Jr. won Florida and therefore the White House and the most powerful job on the planet by fewer than 500 votes. Remember that? I'm old enough to remember that. <laughs> Are you? I don't know. Yet 204,600 black Floridians were legally barred from voting. Additionally, many others of all races who tried to vote could not because their names appeared on felon lists. Had the felons not been disenfranchised, candidate Bush would have lost. However, candidate Albert Gore's party shares equal responsibility with Bush's for creating widespread disenfranchisement and could not protest on that front. Thus, the structural effects of racism significantly shaped the electoral sphere with ineluctably global consequences. Mm -hmm. So that's a prime example of, look, this issue um, has ramifications that are global, right? Because the president of the United States is one of the powerful that really definitely influences the United States of America, but also that job influences what's going on in the world. It's a very powerful job, is it not? Um, so, the, I mean, you know, what's going on here with the prison in the prison system, the criminal justice system, it's having global consequences. You know, to this day, you know, that was just a, a, an example from the past, but, you know, we can, I can bring you many modern examples, but I will continue. Uh, this is the second paragraph of page 131. An exercise through criminal laws that target certain kinds of people in places disorganized by globalizations, adjustments, racism is structural, not individual or incremental. We talked about that. The sturdy curtain of U.S. racism enables and veils the complex economic, political, and social processes of prison expansion. Mm -hmm. And I put in my notes, prisons are used as tools for social economic control rather than delivering justice, which we just said. You know, you might, again, the question was, well, why don't, you know, or not the question, uh, the point was, a lot of people bring up the point like, well, you know, if you do something horrible, your, your vote should be taken away from you. you, you, you that right should be gone. Right? But as we see, like, no, the system really is about taking away votes from people, not to deliver justice, but to control power, right? You know, to control elections. That's what's really going on here. Right? So if your concern is like dealing with crime, that, that's actually not what prisons are doing. But let me continue. Uh, this is the end of page 132. We are now in the essay, Fatal Couplings of Power and Difference, Notes on Racism and Geography. By place, I mean the range of kinds of places, as intimate as the body and as abstract yet distinctive as a productive region or nation state. I skip down nine lines. One, what work does prison do? Two, for whom? And three, to what end? 
Those three initial questions prompted a subsequent pair of interrelated questions, which Golden Gulag, the book that she wrote, and I'm pretty sure I'm probably gonna read that and make a video about that, ask and answers. Because those are very important questions, and we just talked about that, right? With the whole voting, controlling the votes thing. So what what do prisons actually do? You know, we say like, oh, you know, they're a way to uh, deliver justice. They're a way to address crime. Is it really that? Is that really what prisons do? Let's think about this. What work does prisons do? And for who? Right? Because it's not for people of color, <laughs> as we can clearly see and statistically. And to what end? What, what is the end goal of this, of prison work? And here I want to read you this uh, footnote here. It's the eighth footnote, and it's on page 135. And it is the fits of the last line of that footnote. Let me read you this. One can and should be able to analyze black, black ponder, <laughs> black materially, which is to say with contingent accuracy. Such a claim hardly signifies that black then always refers to the same cultural or biological object. Blackness is a spatially and temporally differentiated produced in real condition of existence and category of analysis. So, you know, and I put in my notes, race in the context of geography, blackness as a material locality. So it's not, so what is being black? What, what is blackness? You know, when I say black ponder, what, I, what do I mean? I mean somebody who thinks in this uniquely spatial or temporal existence that's different from uh, somebody who is not black, right? People who are black share that kind of spatial and temporal differentiation in our society. Right? We might respond to it in different ways, but we share that same um, space-time uh, distortion. And so we're going to ponder differently. We're going to think differently about things because of that distortion than, you know, say somebody who's white. Apparently, you might say, well, you know, whiteness, blackness are, are they're made up concepts. Yeah, but society, there's, there's real effects that happen in society based off of race, which affects the way we think about things, right? And that's why, you know, black ponder, right? Because I'm thinking about these things differently than, say, the average white person, you know? And it's important to take that into consideration. Because I'm thinking about philosophy with this, this, this space-time distortion that I have in society. As you know, most people you see on YouTube or the internet or just people in, gen in the general like philosophy um, institutions, they're, they're not black. Right? So they, that's a certain point of space and time that they're talking about. Way, the way they think and the way they critical, critically analyze things is different than somebody like me. You know? We're, we're both, uh, you know, we do have, we both are valid, but we both are, have different points of view, which are, needs to be noted. Again, like philosophy is all about distinction. That's a very important tool or uh, thing that philosophy does. It's very good at making distinctions, and I'm doing one right now. Okay, so here we are on page 136, and this is the fourth to the last line. Uh, racism functions as a limiting force that pushes disproportionate costs of participating in an increasingly monetized and profit-driven world onto those who, due to the frictions of political distance, cannot reach the variable levers of power that might relieve them of those costs. Indeed, the process of abstraction that signifies racism produces effects at the most intimately sovereign scale. Insofar as particular kinds of bodies, one by one, are materially, if not always visibly, configured by racism into a hierarchy of human and non-human persons that in some form the category human being. Right? That's just a more scholarly, academic <laughs> way of saying what I just said. Right? Uh, which is just as valid, you know, if you want to like break it down in a more a formal way. But let me continue. The violence of, of abstraction produces all kinds of fetishes, states, races, normative views of how people fit into and make places in the world. A geographical imperative lies at the heart of every struggle for social justice. 
If justice is embodied, it is then therefore always spatial, which is to say part of a process of making a place. Note, my note, the fight for social justice is a fight for space, a fight for meaningful inhabitants. That's what my social justice is about. It's, it's, it's a fight for meaningful inhabitants, right? You know, it's, it's a fight to have a space in the world that is meaningful mm -hmm. rather than a place where you're just being exploited or you know used and oppressed for the benefit of somebody else. And now there was an important point made here. It, you know, one of the last sentences, if justice is embodied, we just said that, you know, uh, freedom is a place and uh, people uh, occupy spaces. So justice is embodied. It is then therefore always spatial. It's about making a place. So if you like, <laughs> you know, if you think about it, because a lot of people will say, and I get this comment a lot on YouTube as well, <laughs> right? Leave politics out of philosophy. Why are you merging philosophy with politics? I want my philosophy political politically um, devoid, <laughs> right? Of course, you know, on top of the fact that, you know, some of the most prominent philosophers, some of the most influential philosophers were political, <laughs> right? And their um, philosophies were steeped in, deeply in politics. On top of that, it is, uh, you know, putting that aside, because <laughs> you can make a whole video about that, but just, just being alive is a political act. Did you know that? <laughs> just taking up space is a political act. Let me, let me read you this quote. Uh, this is page 170. It's the ninth to the last line here. The space itself is a result of the disciplinary configurations within and around knowledge production centers. For example, the university itself in crisis. Okay. That make possible the masking of how we act our politics. Of how we act is our politics. That politics is not ultimately derived from nor reducible to our gestures at the ballot box. Okay, meaning, you know, voting is not is not the only thing that's political. Right? We're like, oh, you vote, so I'm done with politics. No, just the act of occupying a space in the world is political. The institutions you are in, for example, this YouTube video, you know, participating in YouTube videos. That's a, a political thing, right? For example, you know, people, YouTubers are always like, you know, hit the like and subscribe and the, the bell button because that helps out the algorithm and such. And what is this algorithm? You know, YouTube makes money off of uh, advertisers, right? And they're constantly trying to, uh, you know, create or tailor their content to meet the needs of advertisers, which give out big money, big bucks. <laughs> and 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 then that way they you know influence what content is on this channel and what content is not on this channel because a lot of people care about getting that money so they're going to tailor their content to meet these algorithms that are about like these advertisers and like capitalist needs <laughs> right so you're you're what's happening is there's a control of information flow right because youtube is one of the most uh, populated websites or most visited websites on the internet right? and a lot of people get their information from YouTube right? and that information is uh, cur curated by these algorithms right? um, and these algorithms have to do with like social economic power because they, you know it's about selling advertisement space space right and just so just by you watching a YouTube video that I mean that's a political act you know because it's an act of power flow Right. Think about it. Think about it. So when you say I don't, I don't want to talk about politics. I hate politics. Well, guess what? Politics is life, <laughs> and by you just living and breathing, you're 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 being political. But let's talk more about abolition. Right. The the concept of abolition, the philosophy of abolition. Let's return more into that. So this is page two hundred, and this is the essay. Globalization and U.S. prison growth from military Keynesianism to post Keynesian militarism. Okay, so yeah, this is page 200 and uh, this is the, the last paragraph. The media, government officials, and policy ad 
advisors endlessly refer to the moral panic over crime and connect prison growth to public desire for social order. In this explanation, what is pivotal is not the state's definition of crime per se, but rather society's condemnation of rampant deviant behavior, thus a moral, not necessarily legal panic. Okay, we talked about that before, but let me continue. The catapulting of crime to US public anxiety, number one, even when unemployment and inflation might have garnered greater worry in the recession of the early 1980s and the early 1990s, suggests that concern about social deviance overshadowed other possible more immediate issues. Okay, social economic control over social equity. <laughs> that was what was going on. However, by the time the great prison roundups began, crime had started to go down. Mainstream media reported the results of statistics annually gathered and published by the Federal Bureau of Investigation, FBI, and uh, uh, Bureau of Justice Statistics. In other words, if the public had indeed demanded crime reduction, the public was already getting what it wanted. So, you know, the stats are there, uh, as I said before, they were, they were there in the, in the past, they're there now. Just look it up, right? These stats. Um, crime was kind of going down, right? But the more and more prisons uh, were built, and you know, there was this explosion of prison growth and like harsher laws while cr crime was going down. So what's, what's going on here? The prison beds are still there. So this is page 203, the second paragraph. There are two major counter explanations for prison expansion. The first charges racism, especially anti-black racism. The second focuses on the economic development and profit generating potential that prisons promise, suggesting that military uh, Cajunism is giving way to or complemented by carceral Cajunism. So, Keynesianism, or uh, you know, is based off of the you know the ec economists Keynes, or you know when people say Keynesian economics. <laughs> but in case you might not be hip to that uh, term, it's like more uh, neoliberal or modern kind of economic thinking, <laughs> right? Um, a postmodern type of I guess you can use all these fancy words type of thinking where. Uh, the simple ideas of like supply and demand and, and like simple logistic or supply chain type of economics like that, like foundational basic economics was not enough to actually describe the economic system as it actually is. So Keynes was like this, this economist that introduced all these new ideas that kind of, you know, try to address the, uh, the complexity of capitalism, but did so in a way that really didn't factor in like the socioeconomic impact of capitalism or like the, the honest to, to God truth of the, you know, the exploitation aspect of capitalism as it relates to like racism, um, gender inequality, classism, right? I mean, these are things that make cap capitalism more complex, you know, it's not just you know, the whole like supply, demand, basic business one-on-one -on -one thing. And when she, she's, the author talks about military Keynesianism and carceral Keynesianism, she's talking about how the military was used to uh, make people rich, right? Or how like the prison system was used to make people rich, it still is, right? And it's covered up by these like neoliberal, like postmodern ideas <laughs> that try and like add this like, fake com complex layer that's filled with all this economic jargon but really doesn't get to the to the key issue of like capitalism is based on exploitation <laughs> right but anyway let me skip one line and continue reading here the statistical inversion by race of those arrested 70 percent white to those in cages 70 percent persons of color quantitatively indicates that the system punishes different kinds of people differently Qualitatively, the stories of individuals and families caught up in the system graphically illustrate this uneven development. It is also true that communities and industrial sectors are increasingly dependent on prisons for governmental household and corporate income. But these explanations do not show us prison and 
the industrialized punishment system that is the heart of the prison industrial complex. So that's what we mean when we're talking about prison industrial complex. Um, you know, it's not, <laughs> prison is not as just like this method of criminal justice or like this way to uh, allocate justice. <laughs> right? That's not the reality of what prisons do. Prisons are this uh, part of this complex, <laughs> right? This industry, right? That's, that has to do with economics and social control. But I will continue where I left off. Achieved such a central place in structuring the state and shaping the landscape, nor do they show us whether the state is a variation on a Keynesian theme or something new to globalization. In my view, the author's view, the expansion of prison constitutes a geographical solution to socioeconomic problems. Politically organized by the state, which is itself in the process of radical reconstructuring. And I put in my notes here, prisons serve the needs of the state, not the needs of the public. So this is page 204, and this is the fifth line. Surpluses of finance capital, land, labor, and state capacity uh, that have accumulated from a series of overlapping and interlocking crises stretching across three decades. The accumulation of surpluses is symptomatic of globalization. Changes in the forces, relations, and geography of capitalist production during the past 30 years have produced more densely integrated sovereign nation state uh, political economies exemplified by supernatural trade regions. I skip down uh, to the end of the paragraph. If economics, or I would say socioeconomics, lies at the base of the prison system. Its growth is a function of politics, not mechanics. Okay, so again, we're talking about politics here. You know, it's not just mechanics, right? It's not just, it's not just economics, right? It's socioeconomics. Uh, so it's about societal power, which is an issue of politics, which is to say like, you know, politics is not just voting. You know, uh, politics is not just, uh, you know, former President Trump saying uh, Kofifi, <laughs> right? That's not, that's actually, you know, just the bare surface level of politics. But that's, most people think that's all that politics entails. Which is why, you know, social economic power in this country is so skewed <laughs> to this, like, elite minority, right? It's this kind of surface level thinking about what politics actually is. So let me read you page 209, second paragraph. To sum up, there is a moral panic over crime. Civil disorder, idle youth on the streets, people of color out of control, women and children without husbands and fathers, students who believe it is their job to change the world, not merely to understand it. <laughs> it's interesting because I, I mentioned that before, like, you know, on YouTube, I gotta do more than just talk about uh, philosophy texts on YouTube. You know, I want to change the world for the better. But, you know, lots of people, including people who are very powerful, just want me to just, you know, discuss videos on YouTube and, you know, mind my own business. Uh-uh. <laughs> but anyway, and political alliances among organizations trying to merge into full-scale movements. In other words, there is a social crisis. And there is also an economic panic, capital disorder, or the profits crisis. These crises collide and combine into the crisis that prison fixes, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a response. You know, prisons are, are, are social, economic, or political response to people trying to better themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, people trying to break away from the false realities of um, race, uh, you, know, uh, you know, gender norms, right? um, class structures. That kind of like break from that <laughs> into like more true uh, ways of identity or ways of being, uh, you know, which is not advantageous to like capitalist <laughs> society. You know, prison is a way to uh, fight that, that truth seeking. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about that a little more. This is page 240 and this is the second line of the second paragraph. There is no organizational structure that the right cannot use for its own purposes. You know, the right, the political right here in the United States of America. But, you know, 
the right is all over the world, right? That kind of, right, right, right. <laughs> the political right is what she's referring to. I skip down eight lines. Forms create norms. Think about that. She's, she says forms create norms. Okay. Skip down one line. Form does not mean blueprint, but rather the lived relations and imaginative possibilities emanating from those relationships. In a sense, form is a resolutely geographical concept because it is about making pathways and places rather than searching endlessly for the perfect method and mode. You know, freedom is not a, just a mode. It's not a mode, it's a place. Right, a form, <laughs> a form is not just um, a method or mode. A form is a geographical concept, is a, is a locality, is a space, is a space. Say interesting. A great way to think about it, a more constructive way of thinking about it. Um, but we're on top of page 241 now. Oh, I forgot. <laughs> so the essay we're at now is in the shadow of the shadow state. Okay. Funders who want to return their inherited wealth to the communities who produce it should reflect on whether they are building glorious edifices that in the end perpetuate inequality. You know, we're talking about intergenerational wealth, which foundation is that of racism. Uh, skip down six lines. The purpose of the work is to gain liberation not to guarantee the organization's longevity. You know, we're talking about uh, uh, abolition. You know, what's the point? Is to gain liberation. It's not about longevity. Listen, this is why I put in my notes. Social justice is not about working toward the perfect social model, right? Rather, it's about enabling freedom by opening pathways. So when somebody says, you know, oh, and I bring up abolition, they're like, okay, well, what are you gonna do about those criminals? You know, what about those, you got to do about those serial killers, um, those rapists, what are you going to do about them, the pedophiles? And it's like, okay, I don't, I don't know, let's talk it through, let's, because what we're doing now isn't working, <laughs> right? So maybe we need something else. Let's at least try to do something else. Okay, and I'm not saying I have the answers. I don't, I don't say I, I have the perfect model, but I think we do need to work toward a better model. Can we do that? That's what abolition work is about. So now I'm at uh, this essay, Restating the Obvious with Craig Gilmore, okay? And it is uh, page 286 in this book. And it is the, I'm gonna start here on the fifth to the last line. Many activists in critical resistance, okay, critical resistance is a organization that Gil, Gilmore uh, founded and is a part of abolitionist organization warn us not to think of the prison system as broken rather they insist we should imagine it is working and think about what that means okay you know that's what we're talking about is our prisons trying to address the problem of crime <laughs> right and you might say well you know the prisons are imperfect because they really aren't dealing with crime so something's wrong with prisons or is it like no or is the situation like no like prisons are actually working perfectly <laughs> or they're doing a very good job at, at what they're supposed to do so if that's the case so they're not addressing crime so what are they doing right if they're working as they they are meant to be so what are they actually doing right yeah that's the philosophy now we're thinking philosophically the political implications demand an understanding of why the system does work this way and of how we can change the state enough to make real changes in it or what we have been calling non-reformist reform. For those involved in social justice work, we would suggest that there is great risk in not incorporating some analysis of how the state is becoming or has become a penal state. It is not clear that the growth of the prison system will reach some natural plateau. Okay, meaning, you know, more and more prisons are being built you know, at an exponential rate, um, this might continue. <laughs> but just more prisons will be built more and more and more and more people will be imprisoned, right? And uh, the imprisonment and incarceration has not little to do with actually addressing crime, right? So if this continues, like, 
What does that mean? But let me continue. If the state seems to require more enemies, who will be next? And where will the funds be found to pay for the next rounds of increased staff of Border Patrol, Marshals, prison guards, police, immigration, and customs enforcement, not to mention the prisons, jails, and border fences yet to be built. Let me skip down five lines. We have to go deeply into the state and all its aspects, its legitimacy, the ideological apparatuses it wields to normalize the everyday horror of mass incarceration, its budget process, its inner contradictions, its intrastate antagonisms and frictions, all of these places are sites where activists can set their feet to fight the fight. And the sites are, as well, locations where we meet others struggling to piece together lives torn apart by poverty, illness, undereducation, war, long distance migration, flight. Here, where we fight is where the state is. Just breaking it down, you know, that's, um, that's what social activism is. But I'll continue. What else is social activism? Well, this is page 351. This is actually an interview. It's called Prisons and Class Warfare. And it's on the top of that page, 351, if you got the book. Um, Abolition is a fleshly and material presence of social life lived differently. I skip down three lines. Abolition, not a prelude, but a, the practice itself. Okay. I skip down seven lines. Abolition is... Figuring out how to work with people to make something rather than figuring out how to erase something. <laughs> it's not some like destructive like rioters going out and breaking windows and writing the A sign with a circle around it and you know got the black mask and the you know the Molotov cocktails and setting the police cars on fire. You know, that's not what abolition is. <laughs> you know, what I'm that's the perception that is put out, you know, on the mass media, but. Abolition is about making, it's about creating rather than erasing, destroying. Let me continue though. I skip down six lines. Abolition is a theory of change. It's a theory of social life. It's about making things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's abolition. Well, that's, you know, a definition of abolition. You can go deeper and deeper. So we, we'll go deeper and deeper. What is abolition geography then? Okay, and this is page 474, the last paragraph. And this essay is Abolition Geography and the Problem of Innocence. Abolition geography starts from the homely premise that freedom is a place. Placemaking is normal human activity. We figure out how to combine people and land and other resources with our social capacity to organize ourselves in a variety of ways whether to stay put or to go wandering. Each of these factors, people, land, other resources, social capacity, comes in a number of types, all of which determine but do not define what can or should be done. Working outward and downward from this basic premise, abolitionist critique concerns itself with the greatest and least detail of these arrangements of people and resources and land over time. It shows how relationships of unfreedom consolidate and stretch but not for the purpose of documenting misery. Rather, the point is not only to identify central contradictions, inherent vices in regimes of dispossession, but also urgently to show how radical consciousness in action resolves into liberated life ways, however provisional, present and past. Mm -hmm. So that's a more specific kind of abolition through a, a framework of geography, looking at abolition through a geographical lens. So listen to this, listen to this. I, I'm gonna end with this quote right here. So many advocates for people in prison and the communities they come from have taken a perilous route by arguing why certain kinds of people or places suffer in special ways when it comes to criminalization or the cage. Thus, the argument goes, prisons are designed for men and are therefore bad for women. Prisons are designed for healthy young men and are therefore bad for the aged and the infirm. Prisons are designed for adults and are therefore bad for youth. Prisons separate people from their families and are therefore bad for mothers who have frontline responsibility for family, cohesion, and reproductive labor. Prisons are 
based on a rigid two-gender system and are therefore bad for people who are transgender or gender non-conforming. Prisons are cages and people who didn't hurt anybody should not be in cages. Uh, now, this does not exhaust the litany of who shouldn't be in prison, but what it does do is two things. First, it establishes as a hard fact that some people should be in cages and only against this desirability or inevitability might some change occur. And it does so by distinguishing degrees of innocence, such as that there are people inevitably who will become permanently not innocent no matter what they do or say. You know, this classic argument of there will always be those people that you just have to lock up. You know, look at that guy over there. You know, I mean, that dude's crazy. There's nothing you can do about him. You have to lock him up. Look at that guy. He's flipped off. And, you know, you might say, like, well, you know, there's a reason why he's flipping off. Um, and, you know, the common response is, well, I mean, you know, just you just got to lock him. You know, some people just have to be in prison. You know, they, I mean, some people just pop off. You know, most of us are cool, but there's that one person. You know, what are you going to do about that guy? So <laughs> the, the abolitionist asks, what are you going to do with that person? You know, why, you know, the abolitionist, and this is where it gets philosophical, why is that person popping off or, you know, does those horrible things or like, because there's a reason why, right? And to just to dismiss and be like, you know, that, that person, is, there's just no hope, just flaw. That is a, is unphilosophical and is uncritical way of thinking, right? And, you know, if we start thinking like, you know what, we're not just gonna toss this person away. We're gonna like really think about, not to say that this person is innocent or, you know, is, you know, you know, we're not gonna treat them like an angel or nothing like that, but what we're gonna do is, we're gonna really think about why is this person the way they are? Why did they pop off? Why did they do this horrible thing? Because, you know, guarantee you, it has to do with the way society is structured. It isn't just, oh, that guy is just like evil or that guy just, there's just something morally wrong with that. No, it, I guarantee you a lot of that has to do with, okay, the society that this person lived in had a real influence on how this person behaved this way and why this person did something bad. Let's change, let, let's deal with society, you know, because that's how you really solve the problem, right? To make sure like, you know, there's this idea like, well, you know, Bad people are always going to emerge. <laughs> it's like, that's kind of an unphilosophical way of, that is an unphilosophical way of thinking. You know, this is a philosophy channel. Um, you have to come at it, at it like, okay, why is it that some, you know, certain people do certain things or are put in certain circumstances that do these things that pop off or, you know, whether it's like, you know, horrible, they, you know, they cause horrible suffering. If you want to go there, if you want to take that route, because that is a common reaction that I get when I talk about uh, prison abolition. People are like, yeah, but you know, there's some people. And it's like, that's very dismissive. <laughs> it's very dismissive. I'm, I'm, not, and I'm not trying to dismiss the, the, the bad thing that this person caused, for example. Like, you know, the, somebody murdered, raped, did some horrible situation to somebody or lots of people. And I'm not trying to excuse, but I, you know, Far from it. I'm trying to like. I would say just by just throw them up, lock up, lock the key, and just be done with it. Uh, that's that's a uh, you know a way of excusing and uh, belittling the the horror and the suffering that this person caused, right? Or these people caused, for example. You know that's a way. You know if you really want to talk about justice, right? Or like you know trying to you know talk about like address the issue of crime, then we have to go further than that. You know we have to start thinking about okay why did this person actually do that like and don't just stop it okay throw it away you know you're in prison now that's it you gotta like start thinking about okay why you know what is it about this society that enabled that person or directed that person or influenced that person to do this horrible thing because that that's where they answered like okay how can we stop these things from happening you know you're looking at it through a society and that's what abolition is Okay, when you really think about it, it's not some like crack job, pipe dream type of like fantasy, utopian type of thing. You know, it, it is a uh, deeply philosophical, uh, logical, reasonable, uh, you, you know, well thought out kind of uh, problem solving right? <laughs> way of, of uh, approaching the, the problem of uh, crime and social inequality and, um, you know, societal uh, issues. 
So in any case, you should check this book out. You should check this book out. Um, you know, it can, it can, you know, honestly, like it took me a while to get into this one. Um, you know, I was, I'm actually part of a book club and this was uh, the book that we're reading right now. And I would say the first 100 pages, I was about to, what the DNF did not finish because it's very academic. You know, I read a lot of like academic dry books, but this one was like, man, you're just, you're just throwing, <laughs> you just dropped my paper, don't worry. You're just throwing these high academic words, this jar, you know, scholarly jargon. Uh, but I kept reading and reading it because it was part of my book club, and I'm I'm really happy I did because it's it's a real gem, it's a real gem. Stick with it, um, you know, because as you know, I read those quotes, you know, and there's even more powerful discussion going on. I just scratched the surface. Um, if you really want to like really understand abolition as like a serious um, practice, a serious philosophy, a serious like um, activist uh, movement. Um, you know, this is the book you want to you, you want to check this out. You want to check this book out by uh, Ruth Wilson Gilmore. Well, you've been watching the Black Ponder. Tune in next time for more philosophical thought.